Welcome in to the Bro Four Squad podcast, where we're just a bunch of bros drinking beer and talking movies. This is episode 105, and a very special one it is. I'm your host, Jeff Warnasek, joined by our legal counsel, Ronnie Cycli. And today's episode, we actually have for you a very special interview with the writer and director of the cult classic, The Velocipaster. If you have not seen this, Check it out on Amazon, buy the DVD Blu-ray, we'll link it in the description below. But Brendan Steer, the writer-director, was kind enough to come on our show. And Cycli, he's everything we could have dreamed of, right, based on this movie? This has been the honor of my life. I'll just... My wife's going to listen to this and be like, seriously? I'm like, but yeah, no, it was... This was this was a lot of fun. And the movie is a lot of fun. You don't take it too seriously. And, and what I loved about talking to him was he knew what it was. And it was all about just enjoying a project and enjoying the moment. And uh, I, I'm, I'm so glad Amazon recommended this to us. <laughs> if you have seen The Velocipaster, which I'm assuming you, there's a solid chance if you listen to us and check out our shows, uh, then you it's just a great peek into the creative mind of somebody that came up with that idea and executed it the way that he did. And if you haven't seen it, definitely go watch it and then listen to this, because I promise you, we asked Brendan some questions that you were probably thinking of when you saw them. In fact, he settles a, a bet that you and I had. And what I love about, and he, he talks about this too, if you're unsure about this movie, watch the first minute of it. He point blank says, you will know within the first minute whether you should stop watching or you should keep watching. And there's nothing wrong if it's not for you, but if it is for you, yeah, ready to have a lot of fun. Yeah, kick your feet up and enjoy the ride. So, uh, without any further ado, this is Cycling Minds interview with the writer director of the Velocipaster, Brendan Steer. Hey guys, it's uh, Jeff and Ronnie with the Bro Four Squad podcast, and we have a very special guest today. As we told you off the top, Brendan Steer, writer, director, basically conceptualized everything from the cult classic already movie, The Velocipaster joins us today. Brendan, thank you so much for coming on, man. This is awesome. Absolutely, guys. I'm happy to be here. So, Brendan, we, first off, congrats on the film. I think we, Cycling and I, are definitely your target audience, like what you were going <laughs> for, because everything you were, you were going for just hit. Um, the concept alone had us so intrigued, and not going to lie, it took us like 15 minutes getting in, but then once we saw what you were going for, it became complete genius. So... Uh, <laughs> I'm sure everyone listening to this has either checked it out now or they will right afterwards. So maybe just so they know a little bit of like how this got started. What is your background like in filmmaking? And then what actually like what was your start in the industry? Yeah. Um, it, yeah, it's I mean, I've been making films since I was like 14. Uh, it, it's a it's a difficult question to answer because I, I feel like in some ways I'm still very much on the periphery of of the industry proper it's like uh, even this week I, I was like having my first meetings with like agents and managers and things like that everything I've done has been relatively self-propelled um so it started when I was a teen uh you know just making movies with my friend in my backyard with my friends and uh, I think I just realized over time that I enjoyed it more than anyone else. I, I wanted to be a filmmaker. So, um, yeah, uh, that was from that moment onwards, probably 14 or 15. I was just that was the only thing I knew. Uh, I knew I was going to do it. And the way I knew that was I very carefully spent the next 15 years cultivating no other skills. So, <laughs> so I, I was like, it has I can to relate. be that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, if if I gave myself a fallback plan, I knew eventually I would take it in like a moment of adversity. So I gambled I and I was sort of like, you know what? I'm not going to prepare a backup plan and I'm just going to stick with it till it works. So good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I went to film school in Manhattan. Uh, I uh, made a feature there uh, called Animosity, which was my first feature. And then I moved to L.A., to Paris, to Berlin, back to L.A., and Velocipaster. So uh, that's what I've been up to. Ton I did tons of short work in film school that is floating around as well. So, What I love about Velocipaster is, you know, you take it for what it is. It's one of those kind of movies that people have always had a conversation, like, with their friends about just a stupid pun or something. And, oh, well, we can make a movie on that. How stupid would it be? 
but you actually went and did it, right? Like, I think that's the big <laughs> difference between yeah. just talking about <laughs> art. Like, what makes art so interesting to me? It's so subjective, right? Because there's a lot of times like, well, well I could have done that, but you didn't, right? Yeah, what made you, like, this idea that probably started as a joke? I mean, if you want to give us a background on how you got here, but what made it turn into maybe a joke or a comment that you said, you know what, I'm going to do this? Yeah, it's, it's funny. So um, I made, in film school, in 2011, I made a short film version of Velocipaster um, for an in-class project, actually. <laughs> uh, uh, you so, better have gotten an A, otherwise that professor and I... <laughs> right? Have I would it's love funny. to see the comment. <laughs> don't worry, it's film school. The grades don't matter. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I will say that, um, you know, it was a super vague assignment. It was something like you had to tell a, a story in four minutes. And Grindhouse had come out pretty in that time period, um, pretty recently before that. And so it was very novel and cool to me that you could make a fake trailer. Like now it's sort of played out, but at the time I thought that was super cool. Um, so I was texting my friend about dinosaurs as one does <laughs> and <Yeah>. my <laughs> phone auto-corrected Velociraptor to Velocispacter. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> and I knew I had this assignment like due in a month or so. And since I had been just in Grindhouse, of course, I loved movies like that. I was like, fuck it. Let's just do Velocipaster. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I did it. And, oh, um, cool. thank you. <laughs> It uh, it buzzed a little. It was like the first thing I made that had any real audience. And like for me now, it's it's not like you know it, it was it was an audience at the time. <laughs> uh, so I tried to make a feature happen. Feature didn't happen, and um, I moved on. I, I went on and I made animosity. I did the. I graduated film school. I lived my life, and after I had done my first feature, I just couldn't stop fucking thinking about Velocipaster. <laughs> it, it, it hasn't left nice. us for the last week. I know. It, it, it's like that insidious kind of idea that just sort of like worms its way down in your head. It's and, too genius to just not, to leave unmade, I will say. <laughs> right. And so it, it's funny because I am like an art film guy. I, I'm, a, I'm a film school kid. And so speaking in terms of like, the artistic hoops I had to jump through in my own brain uh, to justify doing this movie was uh, was just that. I had to sort of talk myself into it and, and be like, you obviously want to do this movie. So, like, you haven't stopped thinking about it for five years. <laughs> so it would actually be more artistically true to yourself to go and make the fucking Velocipaster and then you get back to your, your arty feel-bad horror movies whenever you want. So share, that's what it share is. it with the world. <clears throat> yes. A question I had, and I don't know how accurate IMDb frequently is, because I don't know if someone could put something on your profile, I'm sure, and then you have to double check it. But uh, it did say that you were also in a rock band. So I was wondering yeah. if that's still the case. And then did you, uh, like, what was the process of getting some of the artists or the music for this film? And at what point in the creative process were you like, all right, I want this song to play in, like, the whole psychedelic sequence? Like, was that yeah, the yeah. first thing you thought of, like, the music for that? Or is, does that come after in terms of the creative process? Um, it depends. In in this one, I, I knew I was also going to edit. So that was not the case with my first feature. Um, but the budget was so low on Velocipaster. <laughs> and it was such, like, a weird tone of humor uh, that I knew I got. And I knew I was a talented <laughs> editor. So I was sort of, like... I knew from conception that I was going to edit the film. So that gave me a little more leeway with some of the montages. Because normally, if I was going to give it to an editor, they would be very, you know, storyboarded in advance. I would have the track right. locked down. Um, but since I knew I was going to have that wiggle room, um, they're kind of a bit of both. Uh, definitely the training sequence, I knew I wanted um, that Holy Mess song. And very early on, I knew I wanted the holy mess to also be the last thing you heard in the film. Um, the sex scene I actually found after we shot it, which was weird. Uh, uh, that was that was the only sequence in the film I did not storyboard. I was terrified of that sequence because I, I didn't really know what I was going to do with it. And so um, after we wrapped the film, uh, the girl I was seeing at the time was acting as a cinematographer in Latvia. And she was having a really bad time. So I flew to Latvia and I edited Velocipaster there. 
um, surrounded by Soviet bleakness and <laughs> very long winter nights. As someone As, who what studied abroad Soviets? in Leipzig, Germany. Yes, I, in Leipzig, East Germany. Yeah, it's yeah. very, very drab. Wait, sorry, you lived in Leipzig? Yeah, I studied or? abroad in Leipzig. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Yeah, I'm Vision. Oh, ich auch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, We're going to just change the podcast into a yeah. German. Yeah. <laughs> Let me log on to Google Translate real quick, and I will. I am so sorry. I, well, yeah, sorry I, to get on a tangent there, but yeah, because those buildings, I absolutely understand what you're talking about. And the sex scene was me essentially editing myself out of a depression. Like, so I, I was just listening to a lot of the, uh, the you know, the different songs that I knew would totally fit it, and when I found that Math the Band song, I just. Uh, I just loved it. I, I there was something sexual and sexy about it without it being like a fuck song. And right. that was what was interesting to me. Um and, and I, I don't know, like oh, in terms of getting the music and all the stuff like that. Um yeah, I, I just knew everybody. <laughs> like that uh helps. yeah, yeah. Um the Holy Mess uh had one of the main members of the old the Holy Mess is the brother of the keyboardist in my band, so they fit the tone more, and we just asked him to do it. Um, we asked to use the songs. The songs existed. And Matt the Band, that music video for that song was shot by my cinematographer. So, um, you know, he sent it to me so I could, like, review the cut. He was asking advice. And uh, I was like, the, the music video looks great. Can I also use the song? <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, and the opening credits are my band. Uh, that's for okay. Hard. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote so, that song as the backup because I didn't think we'd get the rights to the song I wanted. <laughs> I was right. So well, it's definitely uh, the best. Yeah. that band would regret it now. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> so did you film? Like, was the film the whole thing was filmed in Latvia? No, no. Okay. okay. We can wish. I, well, we, I think because I, I think that said it's something on Wikipedia, and I yeah, that's why we wanted to ask you. It was like that seems interesting because yeah. your budget was said thirty five thousand. Yep. I was yeah, like, yeah. that's just what paid for everyone to get to Latvia. To get to <laughs> right. Latvia. I was like, just that's a vacation at that point. I would love to shoot something in Latvia though. That place is fucking wild, yeah. and like I. I just feel like I have to go back at some point. It calls to me like a pilgrimage. <laughs> so, so one day I will return. But no, hey, we shot we shot it in Pennsylvania and New York. Okay. New York City. Yeah. Okay. It makes a lot more sense. I was just like, that's an interesting play on the budget. So whoever funded yeah. that. <laughs> I held you want thirty five thousand dollars. What are we gonna do? <laughs> Would you mind talking about that? Because I always, you know, I'm always impatient with how these types of films get made in the first place, right? We know not not to insult it, but you knew it was going to go to the movie theaters and make big on the box office. Oh, That's yeah, just inherently yeah. true, unfortunately. So how, you know, how, in what way were you able to get the 35 and, you know, would you have changed anything? Like, Could you have gotten a bigger budget, you know, or is this, the, was this what you wanted? It was perfect for it. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it was perfect for it. Honestly, I, I, so the way I got the budget is very weird. Um, as is most, because I'm wondering how you, how you pitch this to people. I'm so interested. Yeah, in I, I, well, that's the weirdest thing about it. So everybody assumes, or, or I see a lot of tweets that essentially are like, what studio greenlit this movie and stuff like that, right? <laughs> hey, fuck and those guys. <laughs> first of all, yeah, fuck those guys. But, <laughs> but second of all, it was, um, what happened was I didn't pitch it. I was working on the screenplay. Uh, the girl, the my ex-girlfriend, the girl I was seeing at the time, her mom happened to know people in the Chinese art world. And so, of course, I was talking to my my ex about this project. She had mentioned it to her mom. So her mom <laughs> calls me and says, hey, I think I have, how much budget would you need for something like that? And, you know, how being, much you got? Yeah. Yeah. Being an independent filmmaker, you hear this all the time. Like, like people will reach out to you and... It, you know, 95% of the time it leads to nothing. It's either somebody who just doesn't really know how much movies cost or or they're just trying right. to be nice or trying to feel important. You know, um, things that, that happens all the time. So I didn't really think much of it. And I responded, I don't know, probably like 35, 40,000, something like that. And uh, she was like, cool, send over the script and the pitch, the, the pitch packet, which I just finished that day. So I did. 
Um, and the next day she calls me from Germany and is just sort of like, <laughs> hey, Brendan, the movie is funded. The money's in your account. Have fun. Oh, and that my was that. God. I have Did you think it was shit. Shit at first? At it. I have never met her. Um, she is a oh. Taiwanese woman named Jessica. And I don't think she speaks English. <laughs> so, so she has no idea what the fuck she just gave. No, <laughs> no kind she of has milk. no idea. Uh, Did she I, get I, all the rights to it? As the, the She got the Chinese rights. The Chinese and that rights, was all okay. she asked for. She asked for Chinese distribution rights. And so I was like, fuck yeah, That's you can fair. have China, whatever. And I'm um, sure in the script she had the Chinese were, and we'll get to this in a sec, but they were a big part of the script. So she's like, oh, this will play in China. They go to China like four times. I think so. <laughs> Like I, I really, truly, I've never met this woman. That's like I, incredible. I've tried to get the film to her, and um, there's always either a language barrier or, honestly, I think she just doesn't. Sorry, I think she just doesn't care. <laughs> like I think she's so China rich that to her, uh -huh. uh, 35k was just sort of like you know you can drop. I that can't when imagine. You like, a more perfect situation for this kind of film. I Honestly, know. like you, it just sounds made up. I know. Well, it's and great. that's the I thing is that like serendipity and this film uh, just have lined up every step of the way. Mm -hmm. it, it, it seems like fate. Yeah. We've pulled victory from the jaws of defeat basically every <laughs> every single moment of it. So well, it, it makes it, sense. The, the idea was never dying in your head. Like it, yeah, it was yeah. being telling you like you're gonna make this movie, you're gonna make this movie, and things right. just kept working out. Like it, Truly, meant, it was yes. meant to be. <laughs> I just lost my cough drop, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Brendan, I want to ask you, kind of similar to the the process of, of pitching this both to the, the artists in it and then obviously to ways to get it produced and funded, what was your casting process like? Like, how did you pitch this project to actors and what were you specifically looking for? Because I feel like there could be a lot of maybe lost in translation, like from pitch meeting to an actor or even like a, a, an audition to what you want to see on the screen. So I can imagine that was kind of a challenging part of getting this made, too. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it absolutely was. It um casting casting is maybe the most important thing you do as a director um when you're making a film. It's you know your actors are so important, especially in low budget films. They are really the difference between the film being good or not. Because like you could put all thirty five k towards equipment or special effects or something. But if if the audience isn't connecting or caring about anybody on screen, who gives a shit? Like, right. they won't remember the film, um, yeah. regardless of how cool it is. So I knew going in that the two leads had to be professional actors. Um, that's Carolyn, Carolyn Doug, uh, Alyssa, and Greg. Mm -hmm. Alyssa I had worked with on my previous feature, and um, I didn't know her when I cast her then. And so I gave her a, a smaller part. And she really impressed me. So I knew she I was like more her. talented. Oh uh, yeah, you know, actually, never mind. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> I I knew she was more talented than than um you know I had let her be in that film. So I wrote Carol. Whoa, whoa. I knew that going in that she was going to be Carol. Um, Doug was different. I had an actor in mind for it, but the actor dropped out. Uh, so. What ended up happening was we had no lead character and we submitted to a crowdfunding site called Seed and Spark that Greg happened to work at. And he <laughs> happened to know one of the producers on the film. He reached out and was like, hey, uh, can I audition for this? And I was I didn't know this guy. I was like, yeah, sure. Whatever. Crowdfunding guy. <laughs> uh, I sent him aside and he sent in a self tape and he was so fucking good. Like out the gate was perfect for it um so yeah we're getting like a, a michael c hall vibe from him yeah, I, yeah. yeah yeah he's a very he's a very particular feel <laughs> um and i love him uh so what ended up happening was between them i we worked really uh closely actually um us three on making that whole thing work um i wrote them up sort of doug and carol bibles that they you know was sort of me pontificating at length being like, yeah, you're playing a character, but you're also kind of playing an actor playing a character. So it's like this weird dimension. Like, um, there's going to be this push and pull of of sort of the reality of what you're playing. Um, and so once we sort of were all on the same page with that, it was just rehearsals and doing it. 
Um, you know, actors have that skill set. They're trained for things like that. That's why I knew I needed them for those parts. Um, beyond them and Sam the White Ninja, who is a <laughs> professional actor named Jesse, Jesse Turrets, super talented. Um, and I had worked with him before, too. But beyond those three, no one in the movie is a professional actor. <laughs> I kept casting friends and family members and just weirdos I knew. And I kept assuming someone would be bad. Like, like that, was the, that was the whole reason I cast my father is because I was like... You're like, what the hell, Dad? You're actually, like, good at this? You never told yeah, me that. Yeah, that was, that was literally each and every one of them. I figured, but just by basic odds... If I if I did that, then eventually somebody would be funny bad. Yeah. No, no one was bad at all. But I think your <laughs> so... dad, as Father Stewart, ends up being like a total scene stealer in this movie. I yeah, agree. he does. He does. I, I'm totally with you. Which is why yeah. I love the Vietnam scene so much. Best, it's the best scene in the movie, I'm telling yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Like... Well, so I want to lead into that, basically what you guys were just saying. So I've, uh, the culture, what is a culture like on set when you're filming this kind of movie? You know, because yeah. you're towing this really fine line of obviously you're being funny, but you're kind of being serious, but you're also acknowledging what kind of film this is. I mean, it's called Velocipaster, right. Right? right? Where do you, like, how, how do you manage that? Are you guys kind of having fun on set? Is it silly or is it still this like professional dynamic? Yes, you know what yeah. the end product's going to be. But it, but when you're doing it, no, no, we're we're locked down. Right. In. right. Um, I mean, it truly changes set to set. Uh, but for Velocipaster in specific, um, it was a fucking blast. Honestly, <laughs> I it have looks never like it would be so fun to be on set. <laughs> I have never when the ninjas are just doing this in the background, life. they're just punching yeah. the air. I was like, I want to well, be in this movie. <laughs> and and the thing is, it's it was super open and collaborative. Like everybody, everybody just got it from like day one. Um, the first scene we shot in the movie, the first shot of day one, was uh the reveal of um Sam in the as the brother in the kitchen. <laughs> Genius. <laughs> I, the I don't know how you come shot, up with this, but wow. The moment the shot cut, the whole set burst into laughter. Like, every <laughs> single person in the room just started cracking the fuck up because it was really funny. Well, when the reveal and, happened, we were like, wasn't he an only child? And then yeah, the camera pans out, we like, holy shit. You're my favorite an only son. <laughs> like, wait, what? <laughs> I'm so proud of you, Doug. You're my only son. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Like, it's incredible. And no one acknowledges him. <laughs> <laughs> They're terrible parents. I wanted. I was like, does he have a brother who is always ignored that he like based this off of? I loved it. Yeah, it was. It, um, I honestly, I got that from anime. I, I, it feels like at the ending battle of every shonen anime, or like right so before true. the ending battle, somebody is revealed to be like a cousin or a secret <laughs> brother or like something. I'm your stepsister. So you know, whatever. And I, I wanted to do that because I just thought, what is the most insane escalation that I could have? That's right it. Before this <laughs> but he's not a long lost brother. He's in no, the other no, no. room. He's just there. <laughs> he, uh, yeah. He's very much part of it. Well, and that's the thing is that, once again, speaking of the collaboration, um, everybody got the joke from the jump. So, like, our production designer um, was a, a Chinese woman named C-U, S-I-Y-U. And... See you uh, came up with so many great gags. Like um when Doug is reading Crime 2, that was not in the script. <laughs> that was incredible. Uh it just said he was reading and see see brought me this book and she's like so it's called Crime and I figure he would have gotten through the first one. <laughs> and I'm like, that's incredible. Like please. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, so oh, it, it truly was super open and collaborative and and just very fun. Uh, I just feel I'm, like that's I'm yeah. very open to that. Like I, I actors are creative people. Everybody on set is a creative person. So it's like, look, if the gaffer has a better idea for the shot or a grip or a PA, go with their suggestion. Like make the movie better. <laughs> so yeah. To that fun. point. And speaking about that exact scene, that there are scene? some some scenes, like hilarious scenes in the movie that are a little bit subtle. Like you actually have to kind of be paying attention to get how hilarious they are. And to that point, the scene where Father Stewart walks in and Doug is reading uh, the dinosaur book and <laughs> conceals it with a much, much smaller book. Oh. 
Like, oh, something that's like that on set. How do you know, like, this is going to be fucking hilarious when we watch it back? Like, how do you know something like that is going to work? Um, you, you have to trust your gut. Honestly, once again, with this one, um, since I was the, you know, wearer of too many hats, <laughs> like, most creative, most every creative decision was basically running through me. So, honestly, at a certain point, I just had to sort of embrace that, and my barometer was me. I, I figured that if I thought it was funny, then the movie does. Yeah. And 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 I also figured, you know, with a lot of things like that, that was an improv by Greg. Gre I did really? not tell him. Oh, uh, I was gonna ask that. That's uh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. No, that was all him. <laughs> and and like I said, once again, the collaboration. I thought yeah. it was really fucking funny. So I was just like, that's that's in the movie. That's do that again. Um, but sometimes sometimes if I wasn't a hundred percent sure about a gag, I would do a take without it. Um, but a lot of those subtle gags were just me choosing it in the edit. Like, um, there's a, one of my favorite moments in the movie is, it, it, I wouldn't say favorite in the movie, but, um, there's a moment where they're arguing in the woods and Greg turns around and he walks into a tree <laughs> and that was just a mistake. Like that was just a, a like the stormtrooper bumping his head. Okay. Exactly. And, and I just thought it was really funny and it was a good moment to cut on. Uh, so I was just like finding finding the subtle gags like that was was mostly editorial and um, yeah just that was it I thought it was if I thought it was funny in Latvia I, I was like then that's funny <laughs> yeah if it's funny here it will play anywhere yeah <laughs> truly do you have a fa like was that like one of your favorite gags that happened the day of that you had yeah. no idea was gonna happen. Him, him hiding the book is. Uh, the book, okay. I, I thought that was a stroke of genius. Um, <laughs> that, when, when I've been talking yeah. to people about this movie, that's like if I have to give them like a thirty-second <laughs> elevator pitch, I yeah. describe that scene to them, and I've had at least three people tell me like, "All right, I'll watch it tonight." Then that sounds Amazing. like <laughs> right. <laughs> It looks like one of those like pocket dictionaries that he takes up. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't even know what he was doing on set. Like, <laughs> I just love the idea that your, 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 the father's there was like mad that he'd be reading a book about dinosaurs. Like, what's inherently suspicious <laughs> about reading a book yeah, about dinosaurs? Yeah, oh no, it's a great point. It's a great point. <laughs> oh, I loved it. <laughs> so, Cycle and I have a few. We we've been debating a few elements of the movie that I figured yeah. who better could actually answer this than the writer director of the film. Okay. Okay. So settle a few arguments here. The first one is that first night that Doug transforms into a raptor and saves Carol. And then he wakes up the next morning. Did they have sex? And if they did, was Doug in his raptor form when it happened? I'm going to say no. Yes. I, I'm going to say that they were chased until until the the true moment of union later in the film Cause, cause i, I remember that, the, the miscommunication there is hilarious yeah yeah, yeah. like i even peed a little they're like what are they talking about <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah in my brain in my brain after doug ate ate the the thug uh he probably just transformed back and carol carried him like i i think that that's what that sense but but yeah i'm happy to clear that up Another, yes, I, I appreciate you clearing that up. <laughs> one one other question I had. So the name Frankie Mermaid, incredible. And the reason he calls himself that even better because he says, quote, he's swimming in bitches. Sure. I was wondering, <laughs> were there, like, how did you settle on that name? There had to be other equally as ridiculous names, or did you just, like, did that just come to you in a light, light bulb moment? Like, oh, his name is Frankie Mermaid. Uh, that came to Fernando the actor in a light bulb <laughs> moment. That uh, Fernando, uh, sorry, Frankie is played by um, a director, a writer director named uh, Fernando Pacheco de Castro. We were film school buddies, um, and like you know, in film school you all act in each other's shit. And so he, I had seen him in something, and I thought he had a fun energy. So when I was writing the script um, or thinking about actually making the feature, I texted him and I was like, "Hey, dude, I have a pimp character for for Carol." Um, would you mind playing that character? And his response was this fucking paragraph that was just like, <laughs> I'll do it on one condition. My name is Frankie Mermaid. Why is it Frankie Mermaid? Because I'm swimming in bitches. I'm going to shave oh the top my of my God. head. I'm going to be, he just shot me a character bio. And like, I was That's immediately, incredible. I was like, okay, you're hired. Like, yeah, yeah do it. <laughs> say no more. Uh, Once you made the sale, <laughs> stop selling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what ended up happening is, um, 
I put the script online uh, a couple of like a week or two ago because uh, I found it on my computer again. And like the movie's made, why the fuck not? Everybody yes. can read the script. Um, and I, one of the things reading it back that was interesting is most of the lines are like pretty word perfect, except everything Frankie does. Because <laughs> he's a uh, wild animal, you can't cage him. I know, and and <laughs> he's a very different character in the script because I knew on set that Fernando has such a talent for improv that um, giving him direct lines would sort of cage him. <laughs> and uh, so I just sort of put down the points he needed to hit and like maybe a suggestion. And I think that he improvised, I'd say 80% of his dialogue. Oh. So it, it's, that is all him. When he's uh, in the confessional, it's just to it's, brag it's, about his just sins, just so incredible. <laughs> like he just, it, and once again, I, I feel comfortable saying that because it's basically just Fernando. I just gave him room to play and uh, he went for it. He's basically again, an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, okay, I was curious about, you know, the serious question and, you know, and in the movie question, it, I kind of got like an angry vibe with some of your edits and your cuts. Um, is that what you were going for? Or it was, it, was this more for fun? Or do you have certain influencers that you've seen in film that, you know, you actually yeah. do like certain styles? Of editing. Yeah, of editing, yeah. Oh yeah, okay. Um Ang Lee is interesting. That that's an interesting one. Um I love Ang Lee, so I think that probably yeah. Uh especially like the ice storm. Like that that mm -hmm. that broke back mountain, things like that. That mode of Ang Lee I really adore. Um a lot of his Taiwanese films are like that too. And I, I've just always liked that style. So yeah, I, I'd say to a certain extent, but it definitely wasn't what I was thinking. <laughs> okay. Uh, what I, the biggest influence edit wise on this movie, I would say it's, it's kind of two things. It's um, a Japanese and they're both Japanese. <laughs> uh, it's a Japanese live action film called Haosu from nine, the 1970s. Um, I love that film. It's one of my favorite movies. And it, it was, it, it has this weird quality. We're almost around every, Almost every scene is like a new visual idea. And I love that about it. It feels like around I got that vibe, the yeah. corner. Yeah, yeah. Like there just is something new. And um I I yeah, I really liked that. It's very experimental, it's very strange. Um and the other big influence is a an anime called um Neon Genesis Evangelion. Um they do a lot of very Especially the further on the show goes, they do a lot of very, what I would call almost impressionistic editing. <laughs> like they, they, it's interesting because like the standard, you know, thought process for almost a century is that like, you you sort of match action edit is what it's called. It's like the idea being that you don't call attention to the edit, you edit as invisibly as possible because if you edit to sort of throw the viewer off um they're being reminded it's a movie right. and that's why mm -hmm. and you don't want that hypothetically mm -hmm. um and that's been the standard logic in hollywood for for a very long time uh, not always 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 but in most films sure and um i just always thought it could be more like it's how do you edit an orgasm it's sort of <laughs> like or how do you capture in an edit um what it what it feels like to have sex it's like that that's that's interesting to me and since i knew that i probably wouldn't have another opportunity to have thirty five thousand dollars in carte blanche i was just right. sort of like yeah fuck it i'm gonna go for it let's do it right here and, you did yeah thank you and yeah. so it was a combination between that and uh, uh if it was funny like sure. like you know uh, so many um a great exploitation film uh, that really influenced the film that Velocipaster is called Miami Connection. And Miami Connection just has these hard fucking edits <laughs> that'll just be like, like, and then you're just somewhere else. And, and you like, just kind of okay. sit up straight. You're like, whoa, okay. Yeah, yeah. And so, and there's an unpredictability to it mm -hmm. that I think makes it fun. And that's why some of the scenes will just go on a little too long. And the other ones, I'm like, ah, we're done with that. We're done with that. Go move on. <laughs> Uh, it, it's, I wanted that freedom. 
to do that. Yeah, that, I think that was yeah. exemplified perfectly in the Vietnam scene. Like to me, yeah. that that yeah. whole how we got to there. I remember saying while in our in our commentary, I was like, I don't, I don't remember how. Why are we are we in Vietnam right now? Like you know, it just was completely thrown at you, and it was yeah, perfect. Yeah. You yeah, know, but you. it was it was very in your face. I loved it. Yeah, and thanks, Brendan. To that point, this this is not hyperbole at all. I think that's the hardest Ronnie and I have laughed at a movie oh in my like God. since oh, Step Brothers. And I'm not joking. So completely sober. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's completely <laughs> sober. <laughs> so I think you even God. said in Reddit on a Reddit thread that yeah, yeah. you you can encourage you know drinking, smoking, whatever you know, yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. gets you in the mo- mood. But uh, you know what? I'll yeah. be the person to say that you can watch it sober completely and. Still love it. Honestly, I have seen it mostly sober. Like I, I almost always watch it that way. So it, it's like I'm I have a screening tonight and um I'm gonna you know, I'm not drinking or smoking before I do a QA. So so it's like I'm gonna be sober and honestly, it's a fucking blast still. Absolutely. Like I, yeah. I'm very proud of that. So thank you for saying something. Can I just ask specifically about that scene with your dad, of course, playing Father Stewart? Whoa. <laughs> His reaction sells it, and and the camera kind of hangs on him for a second, as if to be like, yeah, you just fucking saw what you think you saw. How did you direct him in that scene? And did did I, he and you realize that it was gonna be that hilarious when you were filming it that day? Yeah. Um. So okay. He. <laughs> I told him to just stay still, and for some reason, the choice he made of this face. I, I think oh I think God. he didn't realize how much blood we were gonna throw on him. That, I, I that was think a lot. That's what happened. And so I was like, uh, you know, Dad, we're gonna do this. It's the one. Um, it's it's like one or of maybe three CGI shots in the film, and um, so you know you have to prepare that on set. There's like a thing you have to do. Uh, so essentially. Um, we got the plate of my mom running and we were going to cut it down the middle, just crop out the image. And so literally right in the center where she explodes, we had our AD with a, bu- with a, two buckets of blood. Uh, <laughs> and, um, so when I called action, he just threw them both at oh my, my dad <laughs> and, uh, he was just so frozen <laughs> in like, I think it was like a genuine reaction of shock. So very quickly, I was just like, get the camera over there. We have to get the front of this because it's so funny. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I knew his reaction was funny on set. Um, I must admit, I didn't know how funny it was until I, was I say- got the... A how do you know CGI you're shit. not how do you know you're not just laughing because it's your dad you know like that it's no actually... i know i agree there, there <laughs> were moments that i would ask myself that and like <laughs> I can't I, putting my dad to that I, 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 <laughs> did you please um, tell me you did multiple takes of where you just could repeatedly get to throw him and honestly, go get him cleaned up and do it again <laughs> honestly we didn't have the time uh, like that that was that was a gag that i knew we didn't have a backup uniform <laughs> <laughs> like I, I knew that. Oh, I commented we... on your your the the priest robes. <laughs> like there's like oh, threads yeah, yeah, yeah. coming out. I loved it. <laughs> I we got this for twelve bucks a pop at Party City. <laughs> I had a uh, feeling. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with that scene, the Vietnam scene, when you have a huge blood gag like that, um, you need multiple copies of a costume so you can do multiple takes. It's like humanly impossible <laughs> to clean it off dry it, get them back through hair and makeup. Like, that takes a couple of hours. So yeah. you need multiples. Um, and we didn't have any because hubris. So um, <laughs> with that shot, I I knew it was, uh, it, it was going to work or it wasn't. And it was just sort of like, we're just going to have to roll the dice. And my thought was also, quite frankly, if it looks really bad, then maybe there's something funny I could do with it. Like, maybe right. I could, in the edit... <laughs> Maybe that's the gag, you know, like, it, I'll figure something out. But uh, it came out so fucking well. <laughs> and um, it was truly when I saw the, the CGI comp back from, of my mom actually, like, dissolving into the blood. <laughs> Getting I, exploded I completely. It. It, it Why was no... she in Vietnam? I have no. to ask that question. <laughs> what? Yeah. what? That Maybe she sure? was trying to start a family. I guess. <laughs> like, I, I, I think I just repeatedly, like, I was crying, going, why is she there? <laughs> she loves him, god damn yeah, it. Dude, she was coming to see her man. Clearly. Uh, 
Before yeah. that, the guy who is just incessantly bragging about how like he hasn't been shot in the war, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, who talks like, like, like this is like it's so obvious what's going to happen. I'm like, I love this because we all had that guy in high school. Like nobody could kick yeah. my ass. Like, you're gonna get beat up oh, today. Yeah. <laughs> Tell your son I got the guy through the war without getting shot or hit without <laughs> taking a single hit. <laughs> when he says that in the theater, usually, usually it's as soon as he says, um without like taking a single hit uh, or a single shot or something there's usually from the back of the audience like a ho, 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 ho. <laughs> yeah as everybody figures out what's going on it's right. it's awesome i love it <laughs> another shot i have to ask you about and this was another one that i really want to know like how did you what gave you the inkling that this would be hilarious and not cuz it's so early in the movie like the first yeah. 30 seconds is that <laughs> vfx yep. shot after the car yeah. explodes and kills uh, Doug's parents, and it just says VFX shot of a car on fire. Yeah. I mean, just walk us through that. That's yeah, incredible. So, not in the script. Um, was I? I we had intended, and we actually had the money to go back and do like it was intended to look shitty. But uh, right. my thought was that we were gonna get like a a model car or something, and like put a firecracker in it and shoot it on like a miniature set. And, like, the fun would be that it was, you know, a hokey bad effect. Um, and also very obviously handcrafted, right? <laughs> um, I thought that was going to be the joke. And so when I started editing the film, I had that in there as a literal placeholder. Like, that's what you do, right? <laughs> so um, we wonder. To get... Yeah, yeah, that's really what you do. If it was it's authentically like... saying we're going to put it here. <laughs> yep, it was. And so uh, what what ended up happening was... I noticed consistently when I would show the film to people, it was the first moment they laughed yeah. like every single time. And I was like screening it to like friends, family members, like, you know, other filmmakers every single time. That was the moment they cracked up. I think it and sets so a, a great tone point, for the movie. Yeah. And yeah. that's what happened is at a certain point I was just like, this is the best way to do this. It tells you <laughs> what the movie's going to be. It immediately lets you know, I like in the first five minutes of my movies to like give like, this is what it is, like get in or get out kind of thing. Right. right. Um, and it's good. That's actually really nice to do because you know, you can acknowledge as a director and a writer. Yeah. Yeah. That you're, you know, you're not going to get everybody. You know, no, no, this no. is a very Absolutely specific thing not. you're reaching out to. Yeah, and and you know what, if it's not for you, here's, here you go. Here's your chance to yes. leave. Yeah. And, and I really kind of wanted, I knew it was going to be such a weird tone and that it was not going to be for everybody. Um, so I wanted to give those people like a moment to get off kind of, yeah. um, and so usually what I say to people is, um, genuinely, if you're not having fun by the end of the opening credits, you should probably turn it off. Like, it's not, it's not for you <laughs> right, and that's right. totally fine, but like, just be aware that it's not changing. This is what it is. So, <laughs> Did um, you have friends come up to you and be like, dude, I'm sorry. I love you, but this is this is not for me <laughs> like like try to be yeah. honest with you be like i'm proud of you that you accomplished something but oh ugh. i've definitely had friends do that usually yeah. usually um they haven't seen the film uh -huh. like usually usually it's people that like watched the trailer or you know saw the poster or something and you can just tell yeah. Yeah, it's like like they're just sort of like dude i'm so happy for you i'm right. definitely gonna watch it and you're like uh -huh. you truly don't have <laughs> it's fine. I appreciate, I appreciate it. it but. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, that one was found in the edit. That's, that's true. Fantastic. So that's going to lead me to another kind of uh, on the other end, on the book end. Let's talk about the dinosaur costume that we save the reveal yeah. uh, for the yeah. end. Uh -huh. So I had a theory, okay, or we had a theory, could be completely wrong. You had it rented for one day. And you had to get it back in the store. And <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, yeah, give me the story of the dinosaur yeah. costume. Like, do you guys still have it? Where did you, you know, what actually, yeah, just the whole, uh, the whole background for it. All right. So like the investor, this is way weirder than you could possibly imagine. Here's okay. the story of the dinosaur costume. Uh, when I was in high school, I was in a, um, in my school's film club. I, I was sort of the de facto runner of it um and one year uh we decided we were gonna make a remake of the 1970s richard boone film the last dinosaur and for some reason by some by some whimsy of the tax code we had a budget so our i don't know how much um but our teacher advisor 
bought a dinosaur costume. Good investment. Pennsylvania tax dollars. <laughs> and How a teacher uh, can pull this off is amazing. <laughs> and sent it to my house. So we put it in my basement. The day before we were going to shoot The Last Dinosaur, the principal of the school actually read the script and told us in no uncertain terms that we were not filming this movie <laughs> because it was too violent. So whatever, that film was sunk and we did something else, but I still had this fucking dinosaur costume. <laughs> and so in 2000, because he never asked for it back. So I was just sort of like, well, I'm not going to tell them that yeah, I have I'm not going to bring it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, to this day, um, it is in my parents' basement. Uh, oh my I, God. You, oh, when, oh my God. When I was going to shoot the 2011 short film, Part of the reason I wanted to do Velocipaster was because I was like, I can finally use the fucking dinosaur costume. <laughs> like, you, it's still there. <laughs> you put that online and sign it, and just you could sell that <laughs> for so I, much money. <laughs> and so, so when it came time to do the full feature, honestly, at this point, it was like a member of my family. And I was just like, I've had this thing in my basement for over a decade now. Oh, my God. And this, this has got to be the dinosaur. I um, love how the way a person wears it, their head is like in the they, top of their neck. <laughs> I, I, is that so, the actual way to wear it, or can you wear it through the head, or did they no, just you just make it that far? Okay. Can't. Um, that is you, the way. I, I'm in the dinosaur costume for some of those shots. Um, <laughs> because only my brother and I fit into it. I'm five eight. <laughs> it was literally so made not, for you guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm five foot eight, so I'm not like crazy tall. And this costume was designed for a high school kid, <laughs> so I I I fit. Um, so I had to do it for that, and my brother did as well. Uh, he's he's it most of the time, but if I remember correctly, I honestly can't tell. So, but I I if by my memory, he's mostly the dinosaur. Um. And so any uh, the way you wear it is uh you you crawl in through its birth canal <laughs> and you have to manipulate the jaws with your arms. So you're sort of sticking out your arms in front of your head right like, like sort of in a I, oh I, don't even, I don't even know how to describe the motion like obviously you guys can see me but um you, you have to sort of stick your arms in front of your head and up. It's like the gator chomp. Yes, like yeah, a gator chomp. Slightly over you, yeah. Yeah. And so you are completely blind, you are mostly <laughs> deaf, and you have about I don't it's know, not even comfortable. <laughs> no, no, no. You can't see anything. Like truly oh there's gosh. no secret eye holes or whatever. So I can only speak from my experience, but when you're in the dinosaur costume, you have about five to six min minutes of oper operation <laughs> before you need to get out and breathe. So, so <laughs> For that fight, you're really relying on the ninjas. Like, hey, you you 100%. need to get your ass kicked, and the dinosaur can't see you, so help him out. Oh, exactly. Like, honestly, you're just flailing. You're flailing <laughs> and hoping that they're figuring it out. Uh, and so they, they, that's off to our stunt guys, because that's all them. Yeah, uh, that's funny. And, and so, yeah, uh, the dinosaur is still in my basement. Oh, that's – please never lose it. Never sell oh, out. Never. Get, yeah. I, I truly I truly would never sell that costume. As much as like, I want to pay you for it, like, that that should always be yours. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it would it would honestly be – at this point, it would it would feel like, like selling selling a sibling. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, well, if it's like yeah. the sibling in the movie, yeah, then you say, won't not mind. Like, not like Doug's sibling, though. One that actually yeah, gets not, to not, eat not at the like breakfast him, table. Not like him. <laughs> so I'll um, one more question that kind of related to the movie. So you obviously the last few months, if not year now, have seen a lot of growth in attention, right? And you kind of talked off recording a little bit about that. So I, I want you to kind of mention that to people who maybe didn't hear that part. And also, since you're doing Q and A's, like you said, you're doing a Q and A tonight. What's a question that you're surprised you haven't gotten, or an aspect of the film that you loved? that people haven't noticed, or maybe you're just not, that not people are paying attention to that you would love to talk about. So um, yeah, I, I, would, I would be curious about that. So yeah, um, it, uh, to recap the, the road to get here, like we, we premiered in 2017 at a, at a film festival in Portland. Um, and basically no one saw it. Uh, like it, it was not like a huge gala screening. It was a cool time, but like, you know, it was an audience of like 25 people. Um, so festival coordinators kept passing it around because they talk. Uh, and so they, 
started talking to each other and I kept getting all these emails from people in like Brazil and, and anywhere being like, hey, I run this this science fiction film festival or this horror film festival. Can we see a screener? And so it started going that way. It started proliferating like that. Um, eventually we got a distributor and they released their redesign of the poster and the trailer on ap- on 420, which was the day before Easter. So Perfect. it went... There were a lot of people searching for priests and god stuff, <laughs> and there were a lot of people that were stoned, and so they. You're they just perfect. Thought, <laughs> the, the perfect confluence. Yeah, and, and the poster so, is incredible. Did you come oh, up yeah. with the tagline, or was that something? No, that, that was them. that was Wild Eye. Yeah. A man of the claw. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> uh, they're awesome, by the way. They get the movie so well. Uh, that's why I went with them, because they seemed like cool, genuine people. Um, so anyway, it went viral then. And then we released on DVD Blu-ray streaming on sometime in August 2019. And so in January 2020, it was posted to r slash funny. And that's when it really, I, I, my, <laughs> my buddy's husband texted me that it was gaining some traction and I pulled over my car in front of a McDonald's and I jumped in to do an AMA <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> amazing. because I, I saw an opportunity and I was like, this is, this could be a real, moment. um, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So I spent the next three to four no, I'm sorry, almost 12 hours. Yeah, <laughs> holy shit. That was a very long AMA. <laughs> but, well, Reddit's yeah, a dangerous no. place you can get sucked into forever. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, I had to take a break to drive home at some point. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm at the side of a road here. McDonald's yeah, yeah. like, get the fuck out. <laughs> yeah, I my phone was dying, and I was like, it, it would just, let's just find a keyboard. Like, it's obviously something's happening. Um, anywho, so that brings us to today. Uh, and wait, there was a second part to your question. Yeah, oh, just oh, so yes. like, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So the funny thing is actually because it has become so viral, honestly, people have noticed everything. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing, the only thing. Um, and, and I mean that I'm very happy people have noticed everything. I'm very happy to talk about all of this weird insanity. Um. Things like uh, the ninjas never speak Japanese. Ninjas are a Japanese cultural <laughs> thing. And they speak Mandarin, Korean, and Cantonese in English. <laughs> it was very deeply important to me that they never speak Japanese. Right. There's no, like, so stay away like, from that. <laughs> no, no, no. Because my thought was the, the idea of the joke in scripting was that yeah. the dumb white people that made this movie wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> right, absolutely. And so um, I can tell you, most white people don't know the difference. Tom and, Cruise um, definitely gets it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> here, here is probably the craziest thing that like nobody talks about. Um, the guy that plays Master Wei Chang uh, is uh, an. <laughs> Sorry, it's just crazy. He is an internationally renowned modern artist named Yang Ji Chang. His work is in the Met and the Mama. Oh wow. He he's <laughs> fucking crazy talented. And... How did you get him to this movie? Oh, I was dating his daughter. Oh, so... there you go. <laughs> so... All right. I love I... every connection you have in this film. Like how you this is this amazing. is too it's, perfect. It's, it everything yeah. works. So he um his daughter and I were in a very serious relationship for many years, and so he was just like yeah, like you know I was very close to him, and since I knew I was gonna have this kind of like crazy racist yellow peril character, I was like, <laughs> who could I ask to do that? And so I was at the breakfast table with him one day, and I was like, hey, Chi Chang, do you do you want to be in the movie? And he said yes. He translated his own lines and he flew himself to Pennsylvania for it. Oh my god, um, which is an amazing is relationship like, for the girlfriend's father. Like I've always had weird right. relationships with my. Girlfriend's oh yeah, yeah. Like you're like, hey, you want to be in this really ridiculous movie? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thing. yeah. <laughs> oh, it's awesome. I love the Yangs. They're fucking terrific people uh, to this fantastic. day. Um, and so they, so yeah, he translated everything into Cantonese. Um, and he he and his wife flew themselves out. That's great. Uh, That's so cool. and, and I seriously encourage people to Google him. He's insanely talented. He's 
part of the uh, the Chinese new wave of modern art that's coming out that includes people like Ai Weiwei, um, you know, uh, uh, oh God, Ming Ming and Ping, um, all of them. I've met them all, yeah. <laughs> so it, it's like the, he is very well connected in the art world, and it is so funny to me that he's in this movie. <laughs> like the joke is almost that he's just there. Years like, from it, now, that'll be an incredible like piece of trivia. Cruz to show up in something, yeah. Right. Um, it, it's, it's nuts. That's exactly so, the type of information I was hoping for. Like we would have never yeah. known that I, I go, yeah, that's, that's perfect. So speaking of that, Brennan, everybody listening to this again has probably seen the movie or they're definitely going to go do it right after this. So I'm sure they're wondering, okay, what's next up for you now that you've had this huge yeah. wave of momentum, any future projects you either want to make or anything you can share. And then you, if you haven't had to do it yet, you know you are going to have to fight that appetite from the fans for a sequel or something to this movie. Right. So I'm sure you've already started to get those questions. So what do you think is next up for you? Anything that you can share about future projects? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have had uh, interest in sequels. Uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we're in discussions, we're in talks with people like that right now. So I truly cannot say much. Sure, but yeah. <laughs> obviously i want to and am going to make a sequel honestly yes. i want a trilogy that's <laughs> oh my let's go I, I want i because it's a cult film and you think of yeah. them as trilogies like you think yep. of the evil dead trilogy the yep. dollars trilogy the mariachi trilogy that's the cornetto one um that's how these things work <laughs> so i you gotta go dark I, in the second one. <laughs> maybe, maybe. The second one is very weird and I am so excited oh, for it. Oh god, I'm um, so I, excited. This is perfect. I we are about ten to fifteen pages away from the end of the screenplay. So it's going to happen. I don't know when. Sure. But it yeah. will happen. Um because honestly, even if all the funding discussions fall through at this point, I'm like, oh no, I wanna make this fucking movie. <laughs> you um, crap. So gotcha. I'll figure out a way to do it. <laughs> yeah. I just want the Chinese rights. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Send me thirty-five thousand dollars right now. <laughs> Done. Um, so that one I want to make. The other film that I really want to make, because of course I I have a ton of unproduced feature scripts and stuff. Um, the other one I really want to make is very different. Uh, it is a very intense and dark found footage horror movie about incels. And oh my god, yes. I, I so it's it, and and I'm talking like seriously, it's like Lars von Trier August oh Underground god. level. It's very disturbing. Sign most me people up. that That's, have read yes. it. <laughs> most people that have read it honestly have said to me, "I'm really happy I knew you before I read this cuz Jesus, dude." <laughs> so <laughs> I'm I really The incels are due for that though. They are due. No. Yeah. And I'm just sort of like fuck those guys. Let's Absolutely. shine a light on this. Let's mm -hmm. let's get this out into the world. I've already gotten some uh I've said I wanted to make a movie about it and I've already gotten some pushback from them. So I, I am oh, they like, are a vicious group, especially on Reddit. These. So yeah. So um I really want to make that. It's a uh, it's named after my home state. It's called Montana. And because that is the kind of place that incels live. <laughs> and uh it's set in 2006. So I Here get to put in all the shitty new metal that I want. <laughs> I've been like, I, I've been like jamming so hard to like Deja and Tendu and like, oh God, you know, yeah. Flaw, Godsmack, uh, Corn. Uh, <laughs> there's yeah, a great, no great, totally forgotten band called Forty Below Summer, uh, and I've just <laughs> they fucking rule. Uh, so so. The other thing I really want to make um, and am pushing for beyond um, a trilogy for Velocipaster is that. Because in a perfect world, what I would love to do is be able to sort of oscillate between them. Like like between movies that are like comedies and, and quite silly and fun and movies that are just straight horror. Mm -hmm. I, I love both. And I have no intention of being pigeonholed into either one so Good for you. Yeah. i don't know if montana will come next or after vp2 um but i for sure am gonna make it um those are like it's my like five-year plan well, i'm you gotta, also writing you got a fan and i have two so <laughs> it's very busy but hell yeah uh, Good for you Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're you're a fa I got you got a lifelong fan right here. Uh, I'm really excited about those both projects, all three projects, and whatever yeah, you yeah, do. Yeah. Uh, 
I can just say I'm really glad Amazon told me to watch it. Yes. Yeah, I am too, man. I this still don't know awesome. why it did, but I'm happy it did. <laughs> Sometimes serendipity. It, yep. it was it was the act of God. That's what we can say. Jeff Bezos <laughs> knows what we like, and he yeah. nailed it <laughs> with that Jeff. one. So, yeah. Brennan, last thing before we let you go here, uh, for the people out there, where can they find you online? Um, I know you have a website, obviously, and a social media yep. presence. And then where is the best or easiest place to watch or rent or buy the Velocipaster? I know it's on Amazon now, but might not be forever. And Absolutely. we'll link all these below. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I am very active on social media. Uh, <laughs> I live alone. <laughs> so I'm very active on social You have a cat. Media. You have a cat. I do. I do have a cat. An adorable most cat. My, <laughs> most of my Instagram are pictures of my cat. So, Nothing wrong with that. So um, I, 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 at everything, I'm just at Brendan Steer. Um, and the Velocipaster, if they want to follow updates on the film, of course, we'll be talking about, you know, potential sequels and stuff there, too, uh, is at the Velocipaster as one word. Um, so just the Velocipaster. And that's on, like, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all, all the major social media. I don't do Snapchat. I don't get Snapchat. So I, don't either. <laughs> uh, I, I do not use that one. But most of the other ones I'm on. And, uh, yeah, I will also say that if they want to see the film, um, it is on Amazon Prime. We are streaming for free on a service called Tubi. I mm-hmm. believe it has um, I advertising or something, but... Uh, but yeah, it is for free on there. So if people are really curious but really can't pay for it right now, that's probably the best place to watch it. Please do that over pirating it or torrenting it because I do get uh, residuals from Tubi. <laughs> um, and I know, and of course, you can buy a, a DVD or Blu-ray on Amazon, and the Blu-ray is region free. So if you oh, live wow. outside of North America, you uh, that's that is the best find. way to watch it. Yeah. yeah. And if yeah, I know, I know if, if you search the Velocipaster on my Amazon Fire Stick and you don't have Prime, it brings up the option to watch it on 2B TV. So oh, amazing. You, you're amazing. you're plugged in all over the place. It's really awesome. easy to find it. I, I think there's a big difference too in stealing film like pirating films like that's like Avengers, right? Like and then when you're watching like, you know, low budget, supporting artists, I mean, that you're really doing a disservice to people if you're doing that out there. I agree. Um, now I'm directly affected by it, so of course yeah. I agree. Yeah. But, um, it's, it's a push and pull. Like, I, there, there are, you know, the film blew up so meteorically quickly that genuinely there was all of a sudden an international demand, a worldwide demand for a movie that no one expected to probably be seen outside of the U.S., <laughs> Yeah. So uh, it's based on an English language pun. Like, why do they want <laughs> yeah, that? Yeah, an autocorrect. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> a great question. How are they tra- How are they translating this? I didn't even I, think about I, that. I don't. Honestly, I think English is prevalent enough and enough of a lingua franca yeah. that they at least understand. Like they they get the pun, um, but or or understand that it is a pun. And the other thing is, I think dinosaurs are just funny. Like yeah. I I oh, think that true. that transcends um cultural barriers. So the pitch is still the same. Uh, so all like the Japanese or, or you know, um, Arabic posts I've seen, like where there's no linguistic roots between yeah. English and their language, it, it literally is referred to as just like Mr. Mr. Dinosaur. And so I'm like, fine. <laughs> Close <laughs> I can speak some Arabic. I got you. I got it. I might ask you to send me some of those Arabic ones. I would love to see that. Oh yeah, of course. I found an yeah. Arabic fan sub. Like somebody really? straight up pirated it fan subbed it into arabic wait i'm, I'm gonna sorry go it was, it was arabic or urdu i don't remember but it but it was I mean, it was a yeah. language in that area from yeah, like yeah. the the uh, the fertile yeah because yeah, urdu uses arabic scripts yes yes yeah and i um yeah i'm I'm, That's as fantastic. A hobby, I'm a worldwide so <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah it, it's uh nobody expected that to happen so there are moments that i'm like look I get it. I get it. But I will say, if you have the ability to watch it for free, or I'm sorry, if you have the ability to pay to watch it, (laughs) right, or um, to get the DVD, I obviously would prefer you did. And if you want Velocipaster 2, which you all do, then do it. (laughs) That's that's (laughs) that's on us. So (laughs) yeah, thank you, thank you so much. But yeah, I hope people come out. 
Well, hey, Brendan, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Congrats on all the success. I know I speak for everybody who listens to our show and everybody on the pod. We are really excited to see what you do next. And this was a blast having you on today. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. I had a lot of fun. All right. Uh, you guys know where to find us, bro4squad.com. We're on Twitter at bro4squad. And just type in bro4squad as three words all over the internet. Till next time, we'll see you guys later. Bye.